and that lets you save the who care. Everybody has to work on the five foundations, diet, stress, exercise, sleep, and relationships. Those are the five foundational core things that are the same for everybody. And then your history, and that's how we start to take these general concepts and individualize what we're doing. Welcome to Exploring Mind and Body with Drew Tadia. Drew is an expert in nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. And he wants to help you live a healthier, longer, and more active life. Now here's your host, Drew Tadia. Welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated, Exploring Mind and Body. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our True Form Life community. We're coming at you with a brand new show. We appreciate whether you're listening on terrestrial radio across the country or as a podcast around the world. We certainly wouldn't be here without you. So stick around. We got all that coming up. This is Exploring Mind and Body. Naturally improve your lifestyle one show at a time with your host, Drew Tadia. All right, welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated, Exploring Mind and Body. You heard all about Aaron Hartman in the introduction, so without further ado, welcome to the show, Aaron. Drew, it's great to be here. I'm super excited to share some thoughts and um, and being engaged with you. So. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. All right, Aaron, this is a chance for you to speak to our audience here. I always give our guests a chance to resonate with our audience and tell them who you are, what you do. So I think that'd be a great place to start. I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm also a clinical researcher and I'm an integrative medicine, functional medicine specialist. But what kind of got me down this pathway was actually adopting my daughter, Anna, who has cerebral palsy and special needs. And when I saw that the healthcare system wasn't meeting her needs, it was actually recommending things that actually hurt her health. My wife, who's an OT who works with kids with special needs, we realized we had to kind of veer off the path if we want to get the best things for our daughter possible. And that journey that started, you know, 12 years ago has taken me down a lot of rabbit trails, but also changed my perspective on health, health care, and it's created, you know, my research business and now my functional medicine business. So that's kind of like my my story in, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> And then what did you do before you started this? Well, I, I was a, I'm a family practitioner. I was in the military for eight years. I um, served. I got the um, rank of a major, went overseas. I've done a lot of medicine overseas as well. Pra- um, practice medicine in five different um, com- um, countries, uh, Central and South America, um, Germany. So I just, just typical career development for a um for a hard driving, you know, fast burning, you know, young physician, and then you know, got married and adopted our daughter, and that's when all my my expertise and everything I was doing became super focused on this little at that point in time two year old girl who um, who had cerebral palsy and was never supposed to walk or talk or um, she was they actually said she was supposed to be a vegetable, so that was kind of a game changer for my professional outlook and my academic outlook, and obviously that's changed my um, whole family um, dynamics as well. What is so? What's it? What's the difference between a physician and a doctor? So, um, it depends on what media you're on, what what social media you're on. You know, a doctor could be a doctor of you know philosophy, a doctor of economics. Uh, you know, so when people say doctor in my world it usually means a medical doctor. Physician is more specific; it implies you are a medical doctor. But you can use the word doctor, and you could be a college professor. You know, um, so the word doctor is not; it's a generic term for just a a level of education versus. The physician tends to be more, I'm a medical doctor who takes care of people who has a medical degree from a U.S. accredited medical school. Awesome. That is a great explanation. Thank you. I get all kinds of different people on the show and they all have different titles. And, and I'm like, what is the difference? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, these days there's a lot of boring because what's happening is now a doctor is now the new terminal degree. So whether you're, you know, physical therapist, now the terminal degree is a doctorate of physical therapy. Or my wife, who's an OT, it's a doctorate of that. Um, nurse practitioners now are doctorates and Everything's going to these doctoral terminal degrees. So as you go on and on, basically, it's something different. So why did you decide to join the military? Basically money. Um, I did not have money for medical school. So I had an undergraduate scholarship and the, and the Air Force was like, join us and we'll, we'll pay for it for you. So <laughs> that was kind of a pretty, for me, it was a, it was a low-hanging fruit. Like, well, I have no money and I want to go to medical school. I don't want to go into debt. So I really didn't have a whole lot of options. But it was a great experience. I, I did a lot of things. In the military, there's this, um, basically, if you do well, there's a saying, no good deed goes unpunished, which in the military means they give you more and more responsibilities. So if you're someone who actually works fairly hard and doesn't mind um, working harder, you basically get an opportunity to do a lot of really cool things, which 
I took advantage of all that while, while I was in the military. So it's almost like a catch-22, but the better you do, the more responsibility you get, the more work you get? <laughs> yeah, but it, that's exactly it. And the way you get rewarded is they, they guarantee your vacation time off or you get in rank. And so the way I was rewarded was if I wanted to take time off, my commanding officers usually made sure I got it. And when rank came up, I got it. So I was one of the first people to get rank as they would come up. But it also meant I was kind of like the guy that took care of problems when there's someone upset about something or there's a problem need to be solved or they need someone to run a clinic that you task me with doing it. So um, basically my job changed every six months. So every six months I had a new job. Okay, I got to ask you this because I'm a, I don't mean to insult you, but I'm a Forrest Gump fan. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no worries, man. That's good. <laughs> when you jump on the bus or when you sign up, is it anything like that at all or is that just Hollywood? Well, to be honest with you, as a medical doctor, well, I was I was in medical school, so I was in school. Um, there was a bus that we I hopped on with a bunch of people, and I did my training in Alabama, and we got dropped off in an army base, and there's a lot of people everywhere. So it was kind of sort of like that. Yeah, you're a number. You're it doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter who you are. When you get in with those 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 new people, you're basically one of the group. It doesn't. There's really no. It doesn't really matter anymore. It's like can you follow orders and do what you're told to do. But but so are they yelling at you? Or are they? Uh, is it like scary? Uh, they, they, do, <laughs> they do yell at you. I mean, it's not it's not as bad as people make it out to be. If you're okay with, I mean, no, they're not gonna hurt you. So if you're okay with people, I mean, I was in. I mean, maybe I guess you know I was in college and fraternity. You kind of get used to people saying crazy things, you know. And so I just kind of put it off to like. They're just doing their job. The job is to intimidate me and make me do what they want me to do. I just really didn't. I have no problem listening to authority and just kind of massaging the edges. So um, there wasn't that big of a deal. Didn't bother and I was also, uh, yeah, but also as a medical student, so they took it a little easy on us. Um, the year before, they made all the medical students shave their heads. And so one of the medical students complained to their congressman. <laughs> so... <laughs> Exactly. Like you join the military, they're going to shave your head. I mean, <laughs> I saw, if you saw G.I. Jane, you know what they did? Everybody gets shaved. Right? And, um, and so the result was when I, the next year, they didn't make us shave our heads, but we still got up at three o'clock in the morning to shine our shoes and do all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's just, it's part of the experience. When you join the military, there's an experience and you just kind of, you go with it, you know? What happened to the guy that complained? Did he get kicked out? Or? <laughs> well, he complained after he went through. Okay. And so um, it was... You know, someone's going to complain about it. Just when you join the military, your expectation is it's the military. So um, you should expect that, right? <laughs> you should expect someone to yell at you. You should expect to get up really early. You should expect to stay up really super late, not sleep a lot for week after week after week. Um, and at the end of it, you should also expect to do a lot of cool things that you wouldn't expect to do otherwise. You get pushed. So at the end of the time as well, you're like, wow, I can't believe I did all this stuff. I can't believe I repelled down that wall. I can't believe one of the things I did in one of my special training things was we had to field navigate, find a place, set up a hospital. And then three days later, we got invaded. So we had to do all this stuff like mock you know, invasion. Mock, and we have patients coming in gurneys and, and some of them had bombs on them. So you have to like, how would you manage that? And so it's kind of those things. I actually, part of my training actually, and, and this was additional training later, actually helped set up in 72 hours a field hospital in the middle of texas and nowhere um manage it and then we dealt with um being invaded um and then dealing with host um, hostile patients and like it was all controlled of course but it was like kind of cool it's like you, you get a certain sense of i think i can do this you know so what was that training for it was for in case you were in the field in the future yeah it was the the Term of it was called acute skills on C4 combat care casualty course. The idea was to train physicians how to get deployed out into the field um, where there's bad things happening, set up acute care um, scenarios, and then deal with whatever comes. And so, you know, the big thing in the military is training, 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 training. You can never train for real life because real life is real life. But if you do enough different things when it happens, you're not as surprised by, you know, things. Okay. So how many years were you in the military? Yeah, I was four years active duty and four years reserves. And okay. So after the four years, you decided that was enough or you got your degree and then you wanted to move on? Well, I already had my, I, I got my medical degree and did reserves. Well, was in active reserve for three years. And so I did my residency training, came back in as a full-fledged doctor and um, captain to major for four years, and then got out for four more years and was back in active reserves. Um, and when I came back to Virginia after that, I um, joined a, a group practice of physicians. And so the group practice is that I, I want to get to your functional medicine, yeah. slightly different than 
conventional yeah. medicine. So what, what was the transition to conventional to functional? Well, I joined the practice and just started doing things. You know, I've learned a lot. I just started instituting our online form, started a website, um, continued learning things. Um, in 2010, I started my research company, which was as Virginia Research Center. And then um, I was just learning and learning and learning. And as I was learning with my daughter, I was researching with her. I came across the um, Institute for Functional Medicine and the American Academy of um, Regenerative and Metabolic Medicine and just basically took that training in 2012 and started that. And um, it's like a, it's the equivalent of a fellowship and a certification. So it took me about about three to four years to finish that training. Um, and in 2017, I started my clinic, my functional medicine clinic, which was more of a experiment to see. I just kind of built a website. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the question was, you know, build it and they will come, right? And so I was thinking I'd build this thing and, you know, get a few people trickling in. It'd be more like a hobby. And it's just exploded. Um, you know, within six months, I was booking out three to four months. Um, now I've had a physician join me, and there's two of us now in the practice, and we're both booking out four months. And we both have our own story. My partner, Dr. Jensky, is an ER physician, traditionally trained. I'm a family practitioner, traditionally trained. And we both came came into the functional medicine world yeah, via our own stories of personal or family um, health care crisis. Okay. Why don't you hire more? Or is it hard to find people? I mean, you have to find someone, first and foremost, that is a physician, a doc, medical doctor. <clears throat> and you have to find someone who basically, after all that, sacrifices. I mean, it's expensive. I've spent, you know, of my own personal money, money between $150,000 and $200,000 for my own extra training. So you have to find someone who's willing to pin some that extra money and then going to devote two to four years on their own doing it. So you almost sub-select down to a smaller group of people. Um, and there's, in the whole country, there's maybe 2,000 people trained like me. So, you know, in the greater Richmond area, there's only three of us and, the other, and two of us are in one site. So it's just, there's not a lot of us out there. Why don't you get the other guy to come over? <laughs> He's got... <laughs> He's got his own stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, we got yeah, I've got his own stuff going on. That's a good way to say it. <laughs> so okay, so the research is interesting to me. What did that look like? How do you create like a research business or what how does that work? Well basically you need someone who has the expertise to know how to work with the government and with regulations. You know, um, I think everybody knows about COVID now. We my research site is actually doing a lot of research with the Pfizer COVID vaccine. So our site at one point in time was the sixth biggest site in the country for that. So, but it's it's like it's a lot a lot of paperwork. You have to know the regulations. So I um have to hire someone to do that, which happened to be my sister in law. Um, she's brilliant. It's her zone of zone of genius. And um, but my zone of genius was the medical clinical side and actually having a a, um, a group of patients that'd be interested in research. And so we kind of just came together and spent a year or two developing it out. And um, it's been a great great um, synergy. We've done over sixty different. Um, studies in the last 10 years. I published in Lancet and we've been a part of a couple of really, really big um, studies. And now we're a part of, you know, we're actively engaged with this whole COVID thing right now. So, so that research, that's a business. You get paid for doing that research. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then you, and then from there you branched out or are these running together? You branched out into, you know, personalization with functional medicine. Well, 20, so, so I started the research in 2010, started my training in 2012 and then 2017 opened the door for the functional medicine. <clears throat> and so I, I joke with people, I'm a, I'm a full-time clinical researcher, a full-time family practitioner, and a full-time functional medicine doctor. So um, I work a lot. <laughs> these three kind of running all at the same time. All right. So when it comes to the functional medicine, what is it? How do you teach or like, what is your philosophy when people come and see you? How do you gauge what level they're at, how they need help and how can you treat them? I mean, I think the, the, the big, the big idea with functional medicine is it's personalized medicine, hundred percent personalized. So I have to meet you where you're at, your expectations, your philosophies, your health history, where you grew up. It's amazing how many people have health issues based on where they grew up in the country, um, personal trauma, chemical exposure. You know, if you were, I've got patients that were, that were first responders at 9-11, and there's a huge amount of toxin exposure, increased risk for diabetes and cancers related to that, that location. I kind of learned a lot about this from the military, learning about threat assessment. You know, you know, you come into a situation, what are all the risks? And so, you know, a lot of my training previously kind of prepared me for this switch in my to functional medicine, which is truly 100% personalized medicine. And so it takes in, you know, your lifestyle, your, your history, your family history, where you're at, your stress, everything. And it's amazing how the environment affects people's health, how everything. So, 
you know, when you come to me, I have to meet you where you're at. And you want me to leverage all these tools from all these different fields of science to figure out, you know, to maximize your health. If you're one of my, you know, executives or elite athletes, you want to perform better. If you're one of my chronic ill patients, you want me to get you back to the best you you can be. And so I just leverage all my 20 plus years of clinical research, um, patient care, you know, seeing people around the world. And I kind of leverage that to the person in front of me, which is, it's always a challenge because every person is different. And is there, I understand everyone's different when they come and see you. Is there, for our listeners, is there some, some type of general advice or how can we say something that they can learn from your philosophy and the way you teach? I mean, everybody's unique, but we have these foundational things that are the same for all of us. It's diet, you know, lifestyle, stress, sleep, exercise. You know, if you think about half of all chronic disease in our country can now be directly attributed to eating processed foods. That's crucial for your health. If you realize sleep, you know, sleeping six hours versus eight hours a night suppresses your immune system, increases your risk for cancer and diabetes. So sleep is huge. You know, exercise, you know, the best anti-aging drugs or biohacks right now are diet and exercise. Is a person moving? Are they active? You know, stress. I mean, we all have tons of stress right now, you know, like what are you doing to mitigate that stress? Um, so that's the part that everybody has to work on these, you know, the, the five foundations, diet, stress, exercise, sleep, and relationships. Those are the five foundational core things that are the same for everybody. You know, from out that, then you apply the science and then your history. And that's how we start to take these general concepts and individualize what we're doing. So when you talk about stress, everyone's stressed out right now. No one knows what's coming, if they're coming or going. What is What do you recommend to your clients when they come to you stressed out? I, mean, I think the biggest thing right now is almost unplugging from um, all the news and media, social media. It's amazing. We Before COVID, before all this happened, we knew that time looking at news feeds Time on social media was a direct correlation with anxiety and stress. And that was pre-COVID, you know. So, like, if you're stressed, how are you feeding it? You know, is it you're feeding it by uncertainty? You know, the reality is, it's like keeping up with the news is not going to change your relationship with your family. It's not going to change your job. It's not going to change who you are. And it directly increases your stress, you know. Um, Exercise, the best drug for treating depression and anxiety is actually exercise. So if someone's stressed, my next question is, you know, do you actually exercise? Because that actually increases your endorphins, which are your, your mood-enhancing um, chemicals in your body. It increases serotonin, which is your happy neurotransmitter. Um, it makes you feel that you sleep better. If you have sleep problems and you exercise, that can help with that. So these are kind of the general concepts I try to individualize for the people and meet them where they're at, you know, um, that's the big thing. Get me people that I can't, this whole, people use this evidence-based medicine kind of idea that people don't realize it's very much protocol driven. I look at you, I treat you the exact same as the four people before you and not individualize anything to you. And that's where I think functional medicine is different than um, the traditional model of medicine that we practice in our country. What What is the reaction when you tell people like, maybe stop watching the news. <laughs> and I always say that because I say the same thing, but people look at me like I lost my mind. How are you not informed? You know, you get that, I'm you sure. Know, you know, it's really funny. Like people actually, maybe it's different come on the East Coast. Maybe it's an East Coast, West thing, or, you know, you say you also have some time up in Canada. Maybe it's, but where I'm at, people like, everybody's like, yeah, you're right. Like we, um, we don't have cable in my house. You know, I haven't had cable in my house for, I don't have time for, you know, sitting down and just vegging, you know, so to speak. And well, I tell people that my, my kids, we play board games. We sit down for dinner together. We, we go outside and do yard work together. Um, people, they, every, everybody's like, yeah, that's so cool. But how do you do it? And it's like, well, we don't have cable. <laughs> it's just, it's just like, you, you, it's something, it's really interesting. People, it resonates like, yeah, I realize I should not do this. I realize I shouldn't watch as much TV. I should spend more time with my family, friends. I should spend more time praying, meditating, um, being outside. It's just taking that first step to cut the umbilical cord, so to speak, with stopping. You know, I remember back in 2008, I stopped getting a newspaper at my house. Because I got to the point where if I didn't read the paper, the whole paper every day, I got anxious because I was missing something, you know, <laughs> the fear of missing out, FOMO, right? I was experiencing that in 2008, right? I think that's the new thing now is FOMO, right? And a fear of missing out. But I realized, you know, I just have to stop getting the daily news because it's making me anxious if I don't take the 45 minutes to an hour to read it. And so sometimes just forcing yourself to unplug is like the biggest first step. I'll tell you a funny story. I tried to get them to stop putting the, new, the pa- newspaper on my porch 
and they won't. I, I called them and I told the delivery people, yeah. like, stop bringing the paper. And they, yeah. <laughs> they're relentless. They it's, just keep bringing it. <laughs> it's, well, it's funny because um, um, I get the, uh, for me, it's the uh, the JAMA, the Journal of American Massacre Association. Like, they send it to me all the time. It's because of le- readership. If they're delivering to so many people, they can charge for advertising. Right. So they're gonna give, they'll give it to you for free because they get to charge advertisers to say, hey, this is how many subscribers we have. So I have the same problem on the medical side with these journals I get that I can't cancel and they just keep coming to my house. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. they just get recycled. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you about your daughter and the how that worked for you. You said that she was basically supposed to be a, a vegetable yeah. and that changed. What changed or what treatment how did that work for you i mean i think the like my eyes opening up was when she um we'd had her um for maybe you know less than a year and the gi doctor she was really small i mean kids with cerebral palsy are small they don't use the muscles and the doctor wanted to put a feeding tube in her stomach so they could pour formula down into that and so she'd gain weight and so that just didn't feel right because that we wanted her to walk we wanted her to talk we wanted her to crawl and having a tube out of your belly when you're you know one or two that the affects all that stuff. So um, we opted out of that. And six months later, my wife found a growth chart that showed my daughter was right in the middle. She was normal for a kid with CP. And I was like, okay, I don't know where this is going, but this is the right way, you know? And so what it meant was we started with diet, you know, eating real food, which my wife actually was pushing before I even started doing that. Um, and then I started researching, you know, how can I change her genetic expression, her genes? How can I help her nerves to heal? So I started looking at nutritional stuff. Um, I started re- researching different therapies in Europe. You know, people don't realize they're doing things in Europe for decades at a time. You know, this, there's this therapy called pulse electromagnetic field therapy that most physicians have never heard of. Um, just got FDA approved in the United States to treat depression. You know, elite race horses, they've been using this for them for decades to heal wounds. And in um, Russia and Poland, they've been using this technology since the 60s and 70s. So it's literally, you know, over half a century old. Why don't we use it? So I researched it, learned about how it can actually help heal nerves. It can help with neural inflammation. Used it with my daughter. It actually, when my wife had a health crisis and had really debilitating fatigue for about a year, it's actually what got her out of that, that crisis. You know, I started using the patients. So I just researched and every rabbit trail led to another rabbit trail to another rabbit trail. And you do that for, you know, a decade or more. You, you learn a lot. And I, I guess one perspective as well is that, you know, we have a little, I don't know if you have kids or not, but if you have a, little, if you have a kid, it's amazing how motivating a little daughter <laughs> will be for you. <laughs> and it makes you get up at four in the morning and read articles when you should be in sleep. You know, so it's, it accelerated my learning curve. You know, I think, you know, I, I think my wife and I have these conversations. I think I would have gone down this pathway eventually anyway. It just having her was was gas on the fire to me. It's like, I have to make this happen as fast as possible because I have this little girl who has a limited amount of time for me to to work on her and so it started with the basic stuff and it's we're still doing she's hyperbaric oxygen and i'm getting ready to start a new therapy on some of her motor stuff you know so i'm still learning and still applying it to her what was the what was that uh i don't know what it was was it medication what was it that you're talking about in europe that they used on horses um pulse the electromagnetic field therapy so the idea is it's using a magnetic field to activate your muscles and nerves and so um <clears throat> there's a couple devices actually that are used fda approved for treating depression um and in europe they actually use it's actually interesting. They knew this in the 70s. You know, if you think about, you know, remember the Russian astronauts coming back from the cosmonauts coming back and they're weak, right? And they're coming off the little capsules and they're like just kind of weak and flaccid. Part of that is they're actually being separated from the Earth's electromagnetic field. Our bodies actually need the Earth's magnetic field to maintain muscle mass and bone mass and actually our mental status. So in NASA, they developed a suit that actually reproduced the Earth's electromagnetic field so that American um, um, astronauts wouldn't actually develop as severe of issues with muscle loss, weak bones, fatigue, depression, etc. And so then like what happens is you take that that technology for these elite, these, you know, the astronauts are elite athletes. I mean, they're some of the top, you have to be bright and physically active and motivated. And so a lot of things where I'll do is I'll find these things and then apply them to my sicker patients. And so that's kind of, you know, how they're using it in Europe. Um, they're wound healing in the sixties and seventies, they're using for healing fractures and um, people that poor, poor wound healing. So it's been used a lot. Why does it seem like Europe is ahead of North America in so much? <laughs> I, I think it, I think it depends on what you pick. Like one of the things I've learned with this field of medicine is, you know, if I, in in Germany, for example, they're using high dose melatonin, 20 milligrams a day. 
to treat breast cancer patients. I had no idea about that. You know, in Russia, Russian um, Olympic athletes were using adaptogenic herbs in the 60s and 70s to recoup from exercise quicker so they can compete at a higher level. Well, I mean, everybody, well, most, most people have heard of ashwagandha at this stage or adaptogenic herbs. And so I think it's like, you know, if you look at Europe, it's like how many countries are there? So you've got all these different countries and different um, cultural histories, you know, and it's just, I feel like they, and, and they're a little, when you combine all that together, you just, you're going to find all these little niches you can kind of learn from, you know, learning from, you know, a lot of the research in Gre um, Greece, actually looking at olive oil and all the health benefits from it, you know, that's kind of a cool, you know, um, you know, place to go to in Israel. Israel is doing a lot of cool things with biotech. Um, so it's just, I feel like, you know, when we look at America, we're, we're in one big, one big medical system. When you go over there, you're like, you've got dozens of different systems. So I think almost innately, you're going to find more nuanced approaches than if you say, you know, the American Medical Association, that's one organization. But, you know, um, even in England, you've got the you've got an Irish system, you've got the British system, you've got, to, you know, even their influences from India and Australia and Canada. So even like a, a monolithic UK system is still... Um, got a lot more more influences on it than our our single you know system here. So yeah, that's awesome. Very interesting. A nice way to put that because I always think that I'm like in Europe. It seems like they got all kinds of leading, and we're over here like, what are they doing? But I think maybe one way to think about it is what we are the best at the world in is acute care. You know, um, you know, back ten years ago, we the University of Miami was one of the first places in the world to develop this valve to treat aortic issues, and so the the head of the Canadian medical system came down to Miami to get his heart valve treated. He left his country. You know, um, cancer therapies, acute cancer therapies, we're we're at the head of the pack with a lot of that stuff. But we're not as good as is chronic care, chronic health issues, and that's where I feel that. But that's where ninety percent of all health care is not the acute heart attack, the acute stroke, the acute this. It's actually diabetes, blood pressure, obesity, you know, all immune diseases, you know, living with cancer after the chemo. That's where, um, you know, in functional medicine, I, I just have a bigger, my toolkit's bigger. You know, people say, you know, you think outside the box. And I'm like, I don't think outside the box. I just have a bigger box. <laughs> it's a bigger box with more tools, but it's not really thinking outside the box. I'm just realizing that, you know, I just got to make my box bigger and bigger and bigger. Awesome, Aaron. So before we wrap things up, I just want to ask you if we missed anything that you wanted to cover. I think this was just a great, you know, you know, 10,000 foot view. I don't really have anything otherwise to add just, but people, this intrigues people. Um, they should look, you know, the university, um, the Cleveland clinic, you know, it's, a, it's one of the best medical systems in the country has a functional medicine clinic. The largest functional medicine clinic in the world that I know of is at the Cleveland clinic. So this is actually emerging. It's just it takes a hard time to get the message out there. And I'm really glad you kind of help, help spread the news. Yeah, we're happy to do that. Appreciate that. So give us a, a chance to learn more about, do you have a website? Do you have products or services? How can people get a hold of you after after they listen to the yeah. show if they like? I mean, they can just go to my website, which is richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. And that's where I have um, you know, educational tools. I have an online community. Um, I'm just trying to educate people, give people useful information. They can, um, if they want to join the community I put together that actually helps you um, advance your health, they can join that. Um, I have a one on one face to face, but obviously that's limited to people who can fly to see me um, or drive. But I think the, the, uh, there's a lot of good educational resources. And what I tell people is that if, according to Harvard, if 80% of um, heart disease and 70% of cancer can be prevented by diet and lifestyle alone, then you are the biggest, you know, the, you have the biggest impact on your health, not me. It's just giving me the tools to apply. And that's what I'm trying to do with my website. So awesome. All right, Aaron, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us today on Exploring Mind and Body. Uh, Drew, thanks for having me. It was great to be here. My pleasure. All right, that's going to wrap things up for this edition of Exploring Mind and Body. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our True Form Life community. You can always find us on facebook.com slash trueformlife. We post stuff there a couple times a day on our story. We're always trying to bring you more content around living a healthy lifestyle, whether that be nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. We also have free challenges that we do at least once a month. So if you follow us along there, you'll be able to join maybe a plank challenge or a squat challenge, Tabata challenge, 
challenge, whatever it may be, we'd love to have you join us. We're also on Instagram.com slash Drew Tadia. Again, we're posting up there a couple times a day along with our story, all dedicated to keeping you fit and healthy and on track. Our main website is trueformlife.com. If you want to check out some of our products, some of our services, or if you just want some great content from videos to blog posts and recipes and more, we got all that at trueformlife.com. Once again, thank you so much for being here. That's it. That's all I got. I'm out of here. As always, I'm your host, Drew Taddeo, in health and fitness for a better world. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Exploring Mind and Body with True Form Life's Drew Tadia, fitness expert. To find out more about the show, Drew Tadia, or to listen to past shows, visit exploringmindandbody.com.